the time sure flies by when you're having fun. So sooner rather than later, I'm back with another episode of 10 years of C64 gaming. Let's see what's in the store for today. Head Over Heels is an isometric perspective action adventure where you control two distinctive characters at once, each with their own set of skills, head and heels. Head can jump higher than heels, control his movement in the air and fire donuts. Heels can run faster than head, climb staircases that head cannot and carry objects. Initially they are controlled separately, but in time, as you progress within the game, you get to combine the two into singular creature, having access to all the powers at once. Head Over Heels is composed out of over 300 different rooms and literally hundreds of complex puzzles to solve, so if you're a fan of the genre, and especially if you liked earlier Isometric Batman by the same developer, this one's definitely a game for you. In Hunter's Moon, after being caught by a black hole and spit out in another universe, you're stranded in a universe of self-regenerating organic hives. And to escape, you need to capture the star cells that lie within those hives. It's easier said than done, as they are heavily protected by both mind-boggling puzzles and enemies. Each new star system that you'll visit on your way back home contains different kinds of hives with differently behaving defenses. And there are 16 star systems overall, divided into 128 levels. The backgrounds in Hunter's Moon are rather plain, though you can't really expect much more from literal space, but the sprites for your ship and enemies are of really high quality and nicely animated. And same can be said about the sound. Not that it's nicely animated, but that it is well fitting and of high quality. If there's one thing I don't like about Hunter's Moon though, is that it features a one-hit kill mechanic, which may not be an issue initially, but in those latter levels the game would really benefit from a health bar for your ship rather than have it destroyed with just one shot. Apparently there's a trick where you pause the game just as the death animation plays out, and that revives your ship. I haven't tried it myself though, so don't quote me on that. Hyperblob is an arcade puzzle platformer. I know, I know, sounds stupid, but it kinda is. It's set on a mysterious planet Cubos, where you work as a tourist guide and have to make sure that the group of blobby tourists, represented by bouncing ball heads, get from one side of the level to another. And there's 100 of these levels to beat. The blobs bounce left to right and only ever change direction when they bounce off of something. If they fall into openings, they die, so it's up to you to prevent it. And you do so by building a path for them, it's done by removing blocks in one place and placing them in another. Some of these have special properties, among others there are unmovable blocks, disappearing ones that disintegrate after contact, and mutation blocks that make the blob that touched it eat up all the blocks he touches next. If all that sounds familiar and the name Lemmings comes to mind, then it's good, cause the similarities are uncanny. It's not a ripoff though, as Hyperblob predates Lemmings by 4 years. All in all, it's a very unique arcade puzzler that's a bit too fast for comfort in my humble opinion, but when you get used to it, there's a lot of fun to be had here. Hysteria is a stupid name for the game. Not any game, as I can imagine titles it would fit for, but this one in particular. A psychiatrist simulator would be a good fit for this title, don't you think? Not necessarily a good idea for the game though. Anyway, story-wise, an evil cult is changing the past to affect the future to suit their needs. You're terminatorized into the past to defeat the ancient entity that is the source of power for said cult. The game takes place in three different time zones of ancient Greece, Dark Ages and Space Age and you're running and gunning through all three, defeating literally hundreds upon hundreds of enemies with use of your laser shot. As you go about it, you'll get access to various upgrades, with laser arrows and jetpack being the notable too. At the end of each level slash time zone, you face the entity and after beating all three stages, the game is completed. While it's not overly long, it's a bit more on the difficult side, throwing enemies at you in heaps from all sides requiring you to react and shoot fast. All in all, it's a decent shoot and runner, with a very pleasing presentation and sounds that's definitely worth playing even if you're not really a fan of the genre. International Karate Plus is the final official and ultimate version of the game on C64. Conceptually and gameplay-wise, it's no different than the year prior's International Karate. There are some small yet notable changes though. First, that's also the most obvious one, is the addition of a third fighter. So while the game can still be played by one or two players only, there's always three fighters exchanging friendly punches and kicks. Why are they friendly? Well, there's no blood or fatalities, so it's a sport and not a street brawl. There are some changes in available moves too. Twist kick and somersault are both gone, but instead you get a headbutt, which is always fun, and a roll and split jump kick, allowing you to knock out two opponents at once if they're at the right distance on both sides. It's a very movie-like attack and I like it. Makes me feel like a 20 years younger, 20 kilos lighter Jean-Claude Van Damme. Other than that, there's only one change, the most important one I feel. The dry raising is gone. I mean he's there, popping up to announce the points in between the rounds, but he's not present to observe. His keen eye and praise was always well played an area outing. And this omission is a painful one for me personally. 
After all, there's no such thing as too many dry raisins in our games. Scoring is same as it was before and graphics and sounds are virtually identical. I guess you don't fix what works, right? There may have been some superficial changes I've not mentioned but I haven't noticed them. If you love the first game or like fighting games in general, especially those more technical rather than random, you'll love International Karate Plus. Into the Eagle's Nest takes place during World War II and places you in feet of a lone soldier sent to teach a German occupied Eagle's Nest fortress, with a mission to free three captured Allied soldiers and to destroy the fortress itself. While there's eight missions in the game, each with a different objective, what I said initially should be your main goal. And ultimately, that's what you're supposed to do in the game. If you're looking at the footage and thinking that you'd seen it somewhere, then you're not wrong. It looks and for the most part plays like Gauntlet. So all the enemies just charge at you, like lambs to the slaughter never even considering using a gun, which they actually carry. Madness. World War II may have not been the best setting for the game of the genre, it seems. That said, Into the Eagle's Nest should not be played the same way Gauntlet is. There's quite a few changes to the formula. For one, ammo is limited and you need to collect it to keep it stocked. And 99 bullets is as much as you can carry, so you'll be circling back to where you found it and not picked up before. It is also not worth shooting left and right like crazy as you may accidentally hit explosives and get yourself killed. And finally, you must collect paintings for extra points and keys to get through the locked doors. In short, rather than running into each room guns blazing, slower, more methodical approach is better. That said, if you like Gauntlet, you'll probably like Into the Eagle's Nest too. On the first glance, the island of Dr. Distracto is just a side-scrolling shooter. At least if you were to base your assessment on screenshots alone. It's not the case though. The game is composed out of 21 levels where you need to destroy Titula Doctor's fleet of ships and eventually his hideout, a mysterious tropical island. The screen does not scroll at all and your target, be it a ship or an island, is always at the very bottom of it. You can't really hurt it with a small plane though, as shooting with your gun at a huge ship is like spitting at the wall. It sure will be annoying, but will not destroy it even if you carry on for years. So you gotta shoot down the enemy planes, cause when they go down in flames they hit the target below with considerable force damaging it upon impact. And when they do it plenty enough times, the target will be destroyed. The Island of Dr. Distractor is an interestingly designed game with the first few levels being quite easy and then challenge ramping up rapidly. It's not a bad game though and definitely one more for a playthrough from time to time. Back in the 80s, Jack the Nipper 2 was my favorite platformer. It had it all, beautiful graphics, varied in looks and behavior enemies, many weapons, interestingly designed game world and tricks and secrets. It was enchanting and my young self was often attempting to complete it, never succeeding but never giving up either. Now, today, I know that it's nowhere near the best game in the genre on C64, especially that some of the best games came out long after even the Amiga was abandoned. But Jack the Nipper 2 is still charming and fun to play if you know how, because there are a lot of items that you can pick up along the way and carry up to two at the time, and they should be used in appropriate spots to progress within the game, like dropping a mouse next to an elephant so that he would get scared and jump on the tree opening a passage for you, or throwing a jar of termites on a rope bridge so that they would eat through it, dropping the native guarding it below. There's a lot of little adventure combinations like that and solving the game requires you figuring it all out. So while Jack the Nipper 2 is definitely not the best platformer on C64, it's easily among the better ones and worth checking out. Risk, which stands for Rapid Intercept, Seek and Kill, is set on planet Christon 3 that is attacked by aliens, and you're the only one once again who can save it. If I was to count how many times you've saved the universe, I'd run out of fingers and toes. You're the hero, you're the best. Before each mission you can repair the damage or upgrade your ship. It's a novel mechanic and is based on items collected while playing. So upgrades require different combinations of ship parts, blueprints and scientists. And these upgrades can either be faster speed, stronger shot or shields. You get to gather required items and save set scientists when fighting alien menace in a defender-like shooter sections. Risk is quite fun, especially if you're into defender-like games, so if you are, make sure to track it down. While original Kickstart was a fun game, Kickstart 2 the construction set takes it to another level. It's still a side view game for one or two players, where you race on a stunt truck that's filled with water and mud traps, holes, jumps of various sizes, but there are also walls, hills and ski jumps now too. This time though, you have a speedometer so you can control the pace at which you're approaching each of the terrain features and the game comes with a whopping 24 tracks to race on. If that wasn't enough, Kickstart 2 features a built-in really easy to use track editor, extending the life of the game near indefinitely. If you have someone to play it with and there are some drinks involved, then Kickstart 2 with its editor can definitely fill out an evening of retro gaming. If you don't however, then it's a still fun game, just not fun enough to be the only one to play through the night, I think. Toasty! 
Crackout is basically another of Arkanoid light games, but with a caveat that it's flipped by 90 degrees. Your paddle is not at the bottom of the screen and bricks on top, but they're on both sides, left and right. The only other difference is that the power-ups don't fall down, but are revealed on the blocks that you hit, and are represented by the letters that correspond to their names, like E for extended paddle, M for missiles, B for bomb, and so on. Hitting blocks with appropriate letter awards you its bonus. The ball is considerably bigger than in original and most other clones too, but other than that, there's hardly any other differences. Crackout comes with 100 levels, but if you own a disc version, there's over 2000 available for download online to extend the life of the game considerably. While I always preferred original Arcanite or Batty for its two-player mode, Crackout is really fun too and the side view actually allows for longer travel between the ball and the furthest bricks, so that the game feels less hectic at times than the other two do. Playing The Last Ninja on my C64 as a kid was probably the most cinematic experience that I ever had on the machine, other than the Sid Meier's Pirates, that is. It was basically what I saw in the action movies, but on the screen of my trusty C64. I mean, who back then wouldn't want to be a ninja? It was the lifestyle every 7-year-old dreamed of, to be a one-man killing machine on a mission for good. You're a ninja Arakuni, and you have to travel through six beautifully crafted isometric levels to reach the palace of the evil Konitoki, who wiped your entire clan and stole sacred document, all to defeat him. While isometric view games were nothing new in 1987, none could hold the candle presentation-wise to the last ninja. It was on another level and remained graphical benchmark for the next few years on the system. It was so good, in fact, that it wouldn't have looked out of place between some early 16-bit games that we had on, let's say, Atari ST or Amiga. Your ninja can perform few different moves in a block and use various objects he'll find in combat, like a katana or nunchakus, for instance. Gameplay in The Last Ninja was also top-notch, providing exciting combat encounters and both environmental and adventure game-like puzzling. It was a game unlike many, only to be bettered by its own second outing. Legacy of the Ancients is a fantasy role-playing using the same engine that the earlier Questron did. And unlike in most games of the genre, you don't start off as a hero, but slowly grow into the savior's shoes. You're a shepherd who by a coincidence finds a dead body and a mysterious leather scroll on it. This is where you learn that you must find a way to destroy it, as its existence alone invites a challenge from those who want to possess it and gain its powers. So you'll be seeking ways to eventually destroy the scroll, while in the same time fight for your life and complete quests as in any other RPG. Interestingly enough, while you have your typical stats of dexterity, strength, charm, endurance and intelligence in Legacy of the Ancients, there's no experience points whatsoever and you level up by completing quests. The world map is top-down and features towns, cities, castles and dungeons, and these last actually are presented in the first-person 3D style. Games in various towns and certain museum displays allow you to play in special mini-games that if completed successfully will permanently increase your stats. You'll obviously get to fight, cast magic spells, trade and gamble as expected too. Legacy of the Ancients is a full-fledged adventure RPG and a treat to any and all fans of the genre. Legions of Death is a turn-based strategy for one or two players set during Punic Wars between the Carthage and Roman Republic. The game is mainly focused on naval warfare and each of the scenarios has a set victory condition of either amassing a certain treasury size, holding set number of cities or sinking a number of enemy ships. Upon achieving them, the scenario is completed. Both of the sides have different strengths and weaknesses, so Greeks build their ships for ramming attacks, while Romans developed new boarding tactics, utilizing their strong infantry. What's unique about the Legions of Death is that you not only get to pick the ships for your encounters, but you also get to design their loadouts, picking between the equipment loaded, towers and sail, and kind of crew you'll hire. Slaves, archers or marines. In each turn you can move your ships, attack and conquer coastal cities, collect tax, repair your ship and return the gold to your capital. Same goes for your opponent. It's worth pointing out that when played alone, you can only play as Carthaginians, with Romans being available in multiplayer only. Life Force is a top-down arcade shooter where an unexpected event costs computer systems on a huge orbital station circling the Earth to gain consciousness and decide to let the flexible robot caterpillars serving humans to run rampant and cause chaos and destruction everywhere. Most cities on station were overtaken by them quickly and you're sent in a single heavily armored tank to recapture the capital only to destroy it and rid the station of the source of infestation a moment later. There are 8 flexible robot caterpillars, in short FRC, per each of the 3 levels, and they look like snakes from your old Nokia mobile phone that you had in the 90s. The head is indestructible and contains a fuel rod. You can shoot at the tail though, and when it's entirely destroyed a fuel rod can be picked up from an unmovable head. When all 8 rods are collected, you move to the next level. The FRCs are not your only enemies, as there are aliens spawning left and right, clearly bent on annihilating you as well. You are not powerless, however, and your tank is equipped with a laser, smart bombs, heat-seeking missiles and a shield. 
I totally forgot about Life Force before working on this video, and now I remember that I used to enjoy it quite a lot back then. It's not especially great shooter, but for some reason I always found it fun to play. Light Force is one of the better vertically scrolling sci-fi shooter maps on the C64. Story-wise, one of the planets colonized by humans, Regalus, has been invaded by the alien forces. And once more, planet's future and all lives of its inhabitants lie in your capable hands. Thankfully, you're the right and the only, I must add, person for the job. So you'll fly through four differently themed levels, starting with the asteroid belt, then going through water world and orbital platforms, to finally end up on the ice planet. Light Force features a lot of different enemies to fight against, all moving in different formations and speeds. They're quite varied and keep you on the edge of your seat all the time. Simply put, the game's fun. So gameplay-wise, there's nothing I could really complain about. Rob Hubbard's music is a highlight of the sound design and the graphics are pretty nice too, with animated elements in the background and they add a lot to the scenes, no doubt about that. And if there's one thing I could and will really pick on, it's the scrolling. It could be a tad smoother. I'm not saying that it's bad, it just could be much better. Overall, it's a great game and all fans of shooters will love it. Livingstone, I presume, is an action platformer where you play as the explorer Henry Morton Stanley, looking for the missing David Livingstone in Africa. The title corresponds to the famous phrase real life Henry Stanley asked when he found David Livingstone. Funny enough, in the game at the very end of it, the character replies no, sorta confirming that there was going to be a sequel released for it. As you search for the missing adventure, you visit many different themed locations, jungles, a village, a mine, waterfalls, dungeons and a temple. Some of these have secret passages between them, so exploration is definitely rewarded. Your character can walk, crouch and jump, and has four items at his disposal, boomerang, dagger, grenade and a pole. Each of those can be used with a different force based on the length the fire button is pressed, and they can be utilized as weapons or as tools for puzzling, for instance boomerang can be thrown to press far off switches. The game is filled with various enemies and dangers obviously, cause if it wasn't, Livingstone could have just found his own way back. So you'll face pygmies with blowpipes, crocodiles, snakes, monkeys throwing coconuts, quicksand, cannibals and carnivorous plants to name a few. A jungle worth of death. And if that wasn't enough, you also need to eat and drink not to die. And find 5 gemstones that are required to enter the temple beyond which Livingstone is trapped. Well, it's not really Livingstone, is it? We've mentioned it already. Anyway, it's a difficult but fun and rewarding game, definitely worth the time investment. Mean Streak seems like a mix between Mad Max and Road Rush as it takes place in a bleak and dystopian future. It's a racer slash shooter where you fight off opponents traveling long abandoned M25 motorway known as the Battle Track. It's a constant straight with no turns or corners, filled with potholes, oil and water slicks and even oddly placed walls. To fight off onslaught of enemies, you're armed with unlimited forward shooting machine guns, limited rockets and a few uses of oil that you can spill behind you. Enemies are similarly armed, short of rockets and they attack you constantly all throughout the game. Interestingly enough, C64 version of the game allows for simultaneous two-person multiplayer, where there's no CPU opponents and it's just a battle between the two racers. Who can eliminate the other one first? Despite its simplicity, Mean Streak is quite fun, even if a bit repeatable. Mega Apocalypse is one of the better pick-up-and-play shooters on C64. You don't need to immerse yourself in the story, learn about your motivation or what you're fighting against. You just fire it up and keep shooting. And you're shooting, well, planets and moons moving about in a rapid, seemingly random fashion. Let me start from beginning, cause otherwise it would make no sense. You're sorta of flying forwards, inwards towards the center of the screen, with background stars passing by, adding to the feeling of speed. You can rotate your ship in 360 degrees and move all over the screen, destroying anything and everything you come across. Don't think about it, just shoot whenever you see something. And I gotta say it's refreshing just to shoot things for the heck of it and not to save someone or something. No higher purpose here. I mean, even heroes need a day off once in a while, right? Mega Apocalypse features a simultaneous two-player mode which makes it even more playable, and if you add to it 5 channel sound and music by legendary Rob Hubbard, the game would have been a system seller if it released a couple of years earlier. I realize that the footage may give away chaotic vibes, but trust me, if you like shooters at all, you can hardly go any better on C64. Metro Cross is a port from the arcades that, while suffering from an obvious technological downgrade to 8-bit, remained very playable. It's a fast-paced jump-and-run action game that does not overwhelm the player with controls or underlying mechanics. Your goal is simple, there's few stages in the game and you run through them. You don't shoot, don't push anything, don't even have to keep running, your little character does it all by himself. Well, running, the rest is not present in the game. And your only responsibility is to make sure that he reaches the end of each stage by avoiding various obstacles, period. 
Metrocross is very easy to pick up and play and devilishly difficult to master. Because while the gameplay is straightforward, the time you have to complete each stage is so unforgiving that you will require Jedi-like reflexes to even have a chance at completing all of them. All that said, it's a title that feels hella rewarding when you eventually overcome that certain stage you've been struggling with for a while, and the achievements do not always need to be telegraphed on the screen with a sound jingle and a flashy pop-up. Graphics and sounds are not great, but don't let them detract you from playing. Metrocross is definitely a game worth your time and a permanent spot in your retro gaming rotation. 1987 is so good. Or was so good. C64's best, I think. But there's couple more episodes till we can confirm or deny it. For the time being, let me know what do you think about the year so far. Was it as good as I think, or do you find any other better? Also, make sure to subscribe not to miss the release of the next video. 70% of you are not subscribed, so you may never be sure if YouTube decides to send the video away when it's released. Even better, if you hit the bell, new videos will not only land in your subs box, but you also get a short and friendly notification when they're there. So think about it. If you'd like to support the channel grow, I'd appreciate both Patreon and YouTube memberships. All the help I get allows me to release better content and I currently slowly work towards replacing my editing PC. Members get access to my new videos a day early and are always in the loop on what I plan to release, change, introduce, etc. But if you can't or don't want to do that, likes and subscribes are great too. Most of all, however, I would like to thank all the YouTube Let's Play and Playthrough creators from whose videos short bits were taken for this one as a video background to my commentary. You'll find all their names linking to their channels in the description below. They're amazing and thanks to their efforts, retro community can prevail for years longer and in better form than it could have otherwise. So thank you. For me though this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.